Okay, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. I want to welcome all of you here today. My name is Casey Murphy and I'm ACT's Director of Programs and Events. I want to thank you for joining us today for ACT's second webinar this month entitled Reduce, Relocate, Revitalize the Expedia Group Commute Story, sponsored today by our friends at Loom. Before we hear from our presenters this afternoon, I wanted to quickly take care of a few housekeeping items. First, all attendees are on mute during this webinar. If you have a question or have a problem hearing us, please type it in the chat box located in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. We will do our best to answer your questions as the webinar gets going. Second, we will be hosting a Q&A at the end of the webinar, but please feel free to type in your questions as we go. Just note that when you're typing in your question, to please also identify who the question is for when putting it in the Q&A box. Finally, this session is being recorded and we will have the recording up on the ACT website within 24 hours after the presentation ends. Now, I'd like to go ahead and pass things over to David Strauss, ACT's Executive Director, to give an update on what ACT has currently going on. David? Thank you, Casey. Good afternoon. As the premier association for TDM professionals, ACT is focused on efforts to build a strong community of individuals and organizations working to advance and implement TDM at their work sites and within their communities. ACT is your association. It's wonderful, wonderful to see and hear from many of you how valued ACT membership has become during the pandemic. We continue to welcome new members, certify new TDM uh, CPs, and host hundreds on our webinars, virtual discussions, and chapter and council meetings. I know that many of you are facing unprecedented challenges within your own organizations and communities, yet you still prioritize time and energy for ACT. And for that, I wanna say thank you. If you're not yet a member, I invite you to join your colleagues and become a part of our community. I guarantee you that ACT membership will be a valued investment in your professional growth. Before we get started, I wanna take a quick moment to update everyone on some of the news from ACT. Our virtual TDM forum is quickly approaching. The event will feature unique opportunities for attendees to network and discuss TDM issues in small groups. We will host the charrette focused on addressing the return to work utilizing the Atlanta region as a starting point and example, which will feature a fun and fast moving online brainstorming session. The event will also feature the release of Acts 40 Under 40 honorees. So I encourage you all to take a moment to register for the forum. Group discounts, uh, group discounts are available if you have five or more people wanting to attend. I know that many have already logged into our Connect site, our new online member community, where ACT brings TDM professionals together. This is an exciting new benefit for ACT members to post questions, share resources, and network with their colleagues. If you've not yet logged in, or if you've logged in but not yet activated your account, I encourage you to do so, so you start getting the messages and information that's being shared on the site. It's now my pleasure to introduce today's webinar, Reduce, Relocate, Revitalize the Expedia Group Story, sponsored by Loom. Today we'll learn about a case study on the Expedia Group's relocation from Bellevue to Seattle, the case study examines each policy change by mode, revealing details about intention, timing, and impact. As we all know, no one mode is right for everyone. And the Expedia story is proof that flexibility and diversity of commute options is key to achieving lasting commute program success. It's now my pleasure to welcome Kim Jones, Customer Service Manager at Loom, to kick off today's webinar and introduce our speakers. Kim is, whoops. Kim has an extensive background as an advocate and consultant for customers tackling everyday challenges. At Loom, she finds great joy applying her passion for learning and empathy to help Loom's partners reduce parking demand, attract and retain talent, and meet sustainability goals. Kim, the webinar is yours. Thank you, David and Casey, for that warm welcome and intro. 
I am super excited to be here with you all today. I think that the Expedia Group Commute story is really embodying a lot of challenges that pandemic has perhaps put a spotlight on, but it's not unique to the times at hand. So I think a theme that we are all seeing across the board is that um, we need to relocate back to office. Today, we're gonna give a general overview of the Expedia story, but I will plug, we do have the in-depth case study coming um, mid-November. I'll plug this again at the end of the webinar, but to con consider today a general overview, more details to come, and we are happy to answer your questions along the way. So to kick this off, I think the headlines say it all. We are accepting that when folks start commuting back to office, it's going to be that to one of a hybrid working space. We imagine there will be people splitting their time between working at home still, going into office at times, but the key takeaway here is that with the pandemic, we have a catalyst for behavior change as we think about how to support employees get to the office safely, ensuring that they feel empowered to make the best commute choice for them. Um, I think the thing that we really want to consider is that the world is a little bit different when we go back, obviously. What was a prior commute, perhaps you took the bus, it's possible your route doesn't exist anymore. So is there a way that we can balance needs and flexibility and choice to allow team members to make that decision from their self, how to get to office and ensure that they have the information at hand and ready, readily available and feel really supported by the organizations? The other thing that I really wanna press upon is the importance of data and technology. Um, I think something that we really see is that we need to iterate a lot. Our CEO at Loom Sawyer recently presented to the Washington State Transportation Commission, and I think he put it best, we need to adopt and perpetuate a living laboratory. We need to absorb data, learn quickly, be able to pivot and optimize, and that this is really a cycle. It's not a set it and forget it. And I think Expedia Group has done a really nice job partnering with Nelson Nygaard to illustrate the importance of iteration. The other thing I wanted to discuss briefly is as a customer success manager at Loom, I have the joy of hearing what many organizations are tackling right now. And I wanted to share some general themes that we're seeing across the board, some of them exhibited by Expedia as well, but Josh and Melanie will speak to more details in a moment here. Um, I think the general shift we're seeing is offering employees more choice and that flexibility. So here are some ideas that we're seeing. It's really an opportune time to start considering the shift from monthly parkets to daily parking charges. And that's great for employees because you only pay for when you park, it's more flexibility. Or other things like, you know, work from home isn't traditionally a benefit for most employers um, and employees. And now we're moving to this hybrid workspace where you anticipate people will be splitting their time. So in thinking through this time of uncertainty, but also confidence at some point, people will be again, relocating back to office. We're really curious about what are um, the biggest challenges that you predict at your organization. We have a pull up on this screen. There are a few options to read through. So I'll give you a little bit of time to digest. Something I will offer generally that I see is that you know this is an opportune time to introduce new policies that perhaps wouldn't have been considered or adapted uh, previously. But again, pandemic is a forcing function. The time is prime to start thinking through how we can present um, more customized and flexible options for the people that we serve who are ultimately the, the core population of employees. Looks like votes are coming in. We'll give it another few seconds here. Yeah. Almost about half, Kim. Sounds good. I'm I'm curious, guys, get your votes in. And it's multiple choice, select more than one. I see a couple that I'm really curious about is how you collect data, how you ingest data, um, is budget. You know, there's a lens on budget right now for many organizations as things are shifting in the workplace. You let me know when you want to close it out. Let's go for now. You guys had your opportunity. Let's see what the results <laughs> are. All right. All right, share results. This is pretty interesting and telling. So a lot of folks, it looks like um, engaging employees is a challenge that we foresee. I know that communication can be challenging right now with either organizational limits or not knowing where to start. Um, you were in the right, right webinar because Expedia Group really puts their employees first and has um, invested a lot of time and thought to engagement strategies. Something else that I called out as well as a concern is that budget or how to get buy-in from leadership for these maybe cultural shifts as we move to a flexible model. Um, this is great. And again, you're in the right place. Thank you, Casey. Yeah. 
So excellent. So you've probably heard enough about me. Hopefully I've primed this conversation well for you. And I'm very excited to introduce you to um, Josh and Melanie. Josh is Expedia Group's Global Workplace Solutions Director. And Melanie is a senior associate at Nelson Nygaard who has been embedded at Expedia Group to manage their commute program. Um, they're going to provide a general overview. Again, I'll plug this one more time, case study and details to come next month. But for now, um, I'm gonna turn it over to Josh. Thank you. Hi, so I am not a TDM professional, but I was smart enough to get Nelson Nygaard onboarded early on in our planning. Um, our move to Seattle has been over four years in planning. So somewhere in about 2015, when we started talking about shifting from Bellevue, uh, which was Central Business District, um, very typical of Expedia Group's portfolio around the world, to uh, a location out in the Interbay neighborhood in Seattle for our new HQ, it was a very seminal shift uh, for our employee base and for e Expedia Group. The city of Seattle, SDOT was also asking us to fulfill certain conditions in our TMP plan. And so to help with that, Nelson Nygaard came in to help us plan for Seattle. And early on in that conversation, we started to realize that we couldn't plan for Seattle without instituting change in Bellevue itself. And uh, we needed all this time to do outreach to our employees um, to help them change their way of looking at commute. Commute was the single biggest question and concern people had when they heard about our shift. And so everything here became about, well, how do we manage it? And uh, how are we going to even think about Seattle seriously if we don't know how to get there? And it didn't help. It was an interesting challenge that our location in Seattle being what it was, it wasn't downtown, so it wasn't Central Business District. Um, we had to bring in all sorts of new programs and uh, amenities to help our people feel excited about uh, moving to Seattle. And along the way came all these changes we did in our commute offerings. Could you move to the next slide, please? So like I said, uh, I think one of the smartest things we did was we hired Nelson Nygaard. But really there were three or four key milestones along the way that came into play. We sat down with Nelson Nygaard and said, what should we be changing? What could we change? What should that future state look like? And how do we not in a rip the bandaid way, but in a progressive way, move our general way of thinking about commute to that place. Um, and we had, the one luxury we had was time. The reality was that our commute options were gonna be very different from where we were starting to where we were ending up. Um, so we did it progressively. The first year, year and a half was really about people understanding what they could do in Bellevue itself and really change their thinking about, well, I'll just pay for monthly parking and because now I'm paying for monthly parking, I'll drive every day. There was no real incentives. Um, there was some van pool and carpool, very minimal. Um, so every time somebody new joined, we just went and got more parking spots, basically. That was our commute program. Um, pretty early on into that then, when we started to realize how robust our data requirements were, everything from where is our primary employee base? Uh, to how many new employees are joining and what are the choices we are offering them. We realized we had to move beyond Excel. You know, we were in really robust Excel world. And uh, that's when we identified Loom as our partner. And they helped us basically build out a brand new interface to help manage all these various options that we were providing and all the information that was incoming. And it was pretty dramatic. We knew that what we were doing in Bellevue was going to be different to Seattle, because again, we were working with landlords in Bellevue 
And so we had to go in and talk to them about, well, we need to put in this additional software, you know, that can track our people's badges uh, and tell us who's occupying what garage, et cetera. It was just a, a very interesting realization about A, what data can do, but B, what the pitfalls are or the hiccups are along the way um, when we're not set up for that and we don't have time to plan for that. And then the single biggest outreach that commute, our commute team did, and by which time I think, Melanie, I think we were what, up to four plus people for that big push in 2019. Uh, we literally went all out. We had this massive internal group that was sitting there and working through how we were going to communicate, what we were going to offer, what kind of outreach. So we had everything from, you can slack us with a question, you can come to the drop-in desk. They were doing bagel mornings and, you know, uh, trying to create communities from neighborhoods. And I think the results that came out were seriously impressive because the number of van pools that we were able to establish, um, they literally came up with data on, you live in Linwood, and these are your commute choices that you can use, or you live on the east side, well, we can talk to you about our shuttle program. And um, the kind of outreach that went on and the kind of data crunching we had to do to you know, support that outreach was seriously impressive. Um, and we couldn't have done it without Nelson Nygaard. And so I'm gonna hand this over to Melanie to talk about what her team did and uh, and how we uh, went through with this with this wonderful experience that we've had so far. Thanks, Josh. Yeah, four and a half years in the making. Um, as Josh mentioned, we did have the luxury of time. So early on when we were brought into the process, we were able to really dig into what those requirements for the city of Seattle were going to be for the new site, as well as how the employee experience was shifting. Josh mentioned that everyone's commute um, was going to be different just given the Bellevue to Seattle transition and their options. Um, and so we really used those as the framework to build these commute program goals and use, and then used the, the strategies to meet multiple goals within a single strategy. Um, that employee experience was really top of mind for Expedia. It, it's only a 13 miles between the two sites, but it's you know night and day. You are coming from a central business district with a transit center a half a block away, many freeways, lots of parking, um, to a just out of downtown, sprawling, beautiful on the water site with limited transit access, less freeway access. It was just very, very different. So we really wanted to make sure that employees were aware of those changes early on and could help, you know, make choices about what they wanted to do at the new site well in advance of working from the new site. So they could test them, they could do them during different times of day, they could get comfortable with transit routes, like that was really, really important to us. Um, second was managing parking demand. As Josh mentioned in Bellevue, we often just grabbed more parking because we had it in the central business district. The Inner Bay region of Seattle has limited parking as does our site. So we really wanted to make sure employees were prepared to have you know, a really constrained parking section um, and how that would impact both the parking price and um, just their ability to get to campus. So we started with the goal of reducing parking demand in Bellevue and were successful um, and did that through a variety of flexible programming and daily parking. And then that was just part of the behavior change leading to Seattle. Reducing employee drive-in rates is a mainstay of any good TDM program, um, you know, really wanting to get people out of their cars. And that, that was part of our city of Seattle requirements. The goal was to have a 49% drive-in rate in 2019 decreasing by 2% about every two years to, until 2031. So pretty substantial for the employee population that we were talking about in the part of town. Um, but really that, that change wasn't just for Seattle. It started in Bellevue. We wanted to reduce costs through reducing leasing parking. We wanted employees to start that behavior change early. And that was just kind of like the underlying goal of the entire design. And then being a good neighbor. We were the new kids on the block, right? We had not been in Inner Bay before, much less Seattle. So we really wanted to understand and mitigate the impacts to the community we were moving into. Um, the new site is positioned just south, like mere blocks from a major port in Seattle where lots of cruises come in. It's adjacent to two really residential communities. Um, 
so there's, there's a lot happening. You know, people are commuting to downtown for work. People are coming for vacations. We wanted to make sure we would have the least, least, least impact on those groups moving throughout the city. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So um, Josh also kind of touched on all of these bullets, but I wanna just dig in a little bit deeper. Um, flexibility was really our goal and approach from the very beginning, understanding that employees had different needs on different days based on their work schedule, their personal life, et cetera. And we wanted to give them the ability to make those decisions on a daily basis. So that meant um, helping people understand that monthly parking wasn't the only way of life. And that, you know, once they tried one commute mode, there may be others that also met their needs, but on a different day. And the other big piece that we um, worked really hard to communicate to employees was we don't want to villainize parking. Like we get it. Everyone has commitments. Every day is different. Maybe you're late. Maybe your kids need to be picked up. Maybe it's raining and you just don't feel like fighting with the crowds on the bus. I don't know, but it's okay. Like we wanted to help communicate that just because you chose it one day, it didn't mean you needed to choose it every single day. Um, consistent and meaningful employee outreach and education. That was huge for us. As Josh mentioned, we took a really, really high touch approach to employee engagement. This meant everything from personal one-on-one, -on -one, sitting down with someone to talk about how their commute was going to change, both in Bellevue or Seattle, laying out every step-by-step -step direction to get them from point A to B on a bus, taking into account their you know, trip chaining. So do they go to the grocery store every day after work? Do they have to go to the gym? Like, What are those pieces that we can help build in to make their lives more efficient? Um, we have, and we had and still have, drop-in sessions for employees. So kind of like open office hours, if you had in school, um, we man a station and people can drop by anytime during the day to ask us questions about the benefits, about their actual commute. Um, and that is hugely popular. We're currently doing it digitally as everyone's working from home, um, helping to stay engaged with employees and answer any questions they may have about traveling. Um, what else did we do? Josh mentioned the neighborhood engagement. That was a really big thing for us before the move. So we really focused on smaller regions within the Puget Sound, um, dividing the region into 36 unique neighborhoods and creating really specialized inform commute information for them, transit, bike paths, shuttle, et cetera. And then we compared each, each mode to the cost that employees would be spending and the travel time. So it really helped lay out their, their specific options um, and then give them a platform to speak to other neighbors in their groups via Slack. So, that was like our best way to build critical mass in these neighborhoods, to get people to ride share, to get them to talk about what they've been doing, to share their insider tips with their friends. Um, those are still really active and we use them really frequently to push out information to employees. For example, a major bridge in Seattle is offline for the next decade potentially. Um, and <laughs> we have been using our neighborhood Slack channels to really engage with that group, to talk about their options, to talk about what may happen at some point when you know, it is okay to go back to the office. How are they gonna get there? Like that is a really top of mind problem for these folks. And so, you know, we're still actively engaging with them in these ways that we designed for the move, but they, you know, they expand forever. And then data-driven, can I go back please? Thank you. <laughs> um, data-driven decision-making. Expedia has a huge just data-driven philosophy internally and we really, agree with that and I guess um, align to it to start even from the beginning tracking as much information as we could so we could identify trends so we could start making decisions based on what employees were doing so we could understand how we should be budgeting for our programs how so we can understand what kind of programs we should be turning on um, and a lot of that has been thanks to Loom so we utilize that service for our employee facing website um, that is where everything is hosted, all, all the materials we make, up-to-date information, et cetera, but we also pull from it. So Loom has the ability to integrate with parking software, Strava for bike walk, shuttle systems, Lyft, I'm probably missing a million of them, but we just gather all of that data and can create this very robust report on what employees are doing, how often they're doing it, if this is a well-utilized program. Um, and that has just been so valuable to us to help inform everything um, from program design to employee engagement. And it allows us to have a more personalized approach to employee engagement by understanding what they've tried, what they haven't tried, what they're comfortable with, what they maybe need a little more support in. Um, and it's just really been a very, very effective tool for us. 
All right, so this flexible commuting is really built on three pivotal, pivotal programs. Um, the rest of them are really important, you know, thinking about other modes, vanpool, carpool, bike, but th this um, foundation really built the structure to allow employees the space to try those other modes. So the first change that Expedia made on my very first day at Expedia, I would like to add, um, we switched from transit passes only for folks who didn't choose parking to transit passes for all employees. And Josh and I stood in the lobby of the then headquarters building and manually registered people for ORCA passes on paper and then passed out ORCA passes. <laughs> um, wildly popular, we ran some giveaways, but the goal was really to get employees to understand that even though they had a parking permit, we were gonna provide them with free transit access so they could give it a shot. Um, Today, we have over 80% of employees with transit passes and every new employee is given the option on their first day in their first meeting to get that transit pass. Um, it's just a great, great benefit that we're offering and it really takes advantage of and pushes people onto the public systems. The second was the transition from monthly parking permits to flexible parking. Um, in 2018, I believe we did that with the help of Loom after, as Josh mentioned, many conversations with parking garage landlords. Um, but it was, it was a huge shift for employees. A lot of people did not understand that daily parking is actually great for you. You only pay for parking when you need to pay for parking. Um, you don't need to pay for it when you're on vacation. You don't need to pay for it when you are working from home. You don't need to pay for it if you carpool with your neighbor. Um, so that was a huge change management activity for us to just get the benefits of parking across. But it did open those doors for employees to try different things on different days. Um, and create just the, the baseline behavior change for flexibility. And then incentives. With Loom, we started running, I wanna say like monthly challenges based on different modes or your employee status. So if you're a new employee, we would create challenges for you. And those were, those were very popular, but we gave out gift cards or rewards or you know coffee, whatever. Um, and then we moved to campus and we had a fully integrated system of our own. We switched to an actual daily incentive for anyone who walk, biked, van pooled, or took transit to campus. So it was um, kind of like that final incentive to get people out of their cars and move them into potentially another really nice mode. And the fact that it's a daily incentive meant that they didn't need to do it every day to get rewarded. It's just an added bonus if you decide to hop on the bus instead of getting your car each day. Next slide. All right, here we're gonna talk about the success. So this is a very meaty graphic. It covers our mode share from 2015 all the way to prior um, pandemic 2020, so January and February. And it kind of calls out what we consider to be key milestones in program and policy change. Um, you'll see the first is the transit passes um, in 2015. And that really did start the increase of transit ridership um, for the employees at the Expedia group. Second, we have some parking rate increases and some, you know, high touch bike and education programs. Those seem insignificant, but as you're teaching people about what their new commute is going to be, teaching them how to use those modes is also important. Bellevue was not necessarily a super bikeable place. Um, so getting folks the actual hands-on education that they needed to try biking or to try getting on a bus was really important to us. And we you know, started that early, early on in this process. It wasn't just six months before we decided to move to campus. Um, it was continuous over three years, four years. The drive alone rate we saw starting to increase um, early. Like that, it started going down the first year as you'll, as you'll see with the black line, um, but a really big, decrease came when we implemented daily parking in 2018. Um, I will say that was only a portion of our parking in Bellevue, just given the limited constraints with parking landlords and technology implementation at third party sites. So it gave us a taste of what employees wanted and how successful the program would be when we got to campus and had our own facilities. Um, but then in 2019, when we started moving to campus, everyone was in, oh, able to take advantage of that daily parking benefit. And you see the drive alone rate go down even farther. And then um, really importantly, employees really, really eagerly adapted to the new programs on the Seattle campus. The shuttle program, which we had never done um, commuter shuttles before, was so popular. We had a 
25% shuttle mode share in the first year. Um, I guess the only year on campus, given that we're all working from home right now. Um, but that, that was huge. Employees had to learn a whole new system. They had to learn how to make reservations. They had to learn about parking rides for shuttles. Um, but they, they dug in and they really accepted that as their new commute platform. And we had people taking that four and five days a week to work and just, you know, really thankful that they had a non drive option. Um, a little bit about our shuttle program. We really tried to make sure we were serving portions of the population without good transit access to campus. So we had a handful of parameters that we followed, but they, it was designed not to overlap with public transit in the Seattle region. So not create more congestion and help serve people who don't have as many options as potentially other employees. Um, what else? Vanpool, Josh mentioned Vanpool. We actually kind of progressed the Vanpool programming as well, starting with partially subsidized Vanpool fares, going to fully subsidized, then providing such amenities as hotspots and ma matching and things like that. But we now have the second largest van pool program in the region, um, which is pretty huge considering our, our peers are places like Boeing, Microsoft, um, you know, with tens of thousands of employees versus us, which is right around 4,000. So that's a really, really nice list to be a part of. Um, and then transit, we, we knew a lot of people wanted to take transit. We had a fairly high transit rate in Bellevue. I wanna say it was, I don't know, I can't read the graph, um, right around, 20, 30 percent. Um, and then that just carried on to Seattle, which was huge. Um, we had a 26 percent transit mode share in 2020. And that says a lot about employees wanting to take transit because they don't have a direct connection. They, everyone taking, almost everyone taking transit to campus has to pass through downtown Seattle. So we know that a lot of people are making transfers and that's not always, you know, what employees want to be doing on their way to work. So amazing. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about the other things that aren't shown in this graph that we've tracked year over year that just speak to the return on investment of these programs. Our employee satisfaction with commuting and their commute options has increased every year since 2015. Um, so we know that employees are responding well to our programming and our outreach. They, will, they enjoy what we're doing and they're taking advantage of it. Um, we've seen a ton of environmental benefits in January and February of 2020 alone. Expedia Group employees offset over a million pounds of CO2. Um, we know that because Loom tracks it and we can pull great reports that tell us. <laughs> um, administrative efficiencies, Josh mentioned that we amped up to like four plus employees pre the move just to really engage with employees and make sure everyone had the right information. But Loom allows us to have a like a standard staff of about three of us who are doing employee communications, program design, vendor management, et cetera. Um, in a nice clean way instead of Excel sheets forever for every program. Um, it helps us just keep everything in one central location and, and understand what's going on. Uh, give back to the community. We, um, we Josh, <laughs> Josh uh, oversaw the update to a huge trail that runs adjacent to campus as a major arterial for bike and walkers in the Seattle region. Um, and so not only do our employees have a great bike path that they can use that separates peds and bikes, um, but so does the general public. And we really use this as a tool to promote biking with our employees. Like you don't have to be on busy roads. You don't have to do um, lots of traffic. If you're coming from the North or South, you have a really dedicated, clean, active commuting path to get to campus. And that's, that's been such a great benefit. Um, yeah. And then just again, employee experience. We have so many happy employees with what we've done and what Expedia Group has supported through the past four years. Excellent. Thank you, Josh and Melanie. That was such an insightful overview. And I, and I think those, those on this webinar can start to connect. Relocating, again, applies today. It's not unique to pandemic, but there are a lot of things we can do right now with this uncertainty. So when we have that return date, we can put things in motion. I think too, the Expedia story reminds me to suspend my assumptions about what we think people will want to do. I keep mentioning parking and maybe that's an element, but let the data lead. Let, you know, let yourself iterate and embody this living laboratory that I think Expedia Group does incredibly well and put employees first. Again, they know best what is best for them and it's about empowering them to make that choice and ensuring that they have all the options available to them. So another plug for this case studies, I am curious, you know, 
And what are the specifics about how you did all this really cool stuff and have such high return on investment? Case study is incoming again to your inboxes week of November 18th. And definitely recommend you keep an eye out for that. It's going to dive a little bit more, not a little bit, a lot more deep into the actual tactics for each mode, um, what the results were of that, learn how they actually went about transitioning and engaging employees. And I'm looking forward to it myself. I'm really excited to share. And the last parting thought I would have is it's again, an uncertain time, but we have mechanisms in place to start planning. So we can do this together. We have really big goals. Life happens on a longer time frame than just the past few months or even looking ahead to the next year. And let's just keep collaborating and keeping the discussion open. Um, with that, I imagine there are some questions for the group. So why don't I turn it over to Casey to help facilitate? Thank you very much, Kim, and thank you to all of our panelists this afternoon. We do have quite a few questions, so folks uh, stay with us here as we get through most of them and try to do our best. Um, Kim, if you want to advance to that last slide, in case we do not answer your question this afternoon as people are typing them in, and I do want to let you know that uh, all of our panelists today will answer any questions that you have after the session concludes, so please feel free to, uh, to ask them after if we cannot uh, get to your question. Um, first question here, and I'll pass this one over to Josh. Josh, what's Expedia's teleworking policy and how does that work in conjunction with commute management at Expedia? Uh, for instance, how many people, percentage of employees are able to have flexible hours and or days that they are expected to show up at the workplace and how does this affect parking demand and or transit demand? You know, that's, um, I think there's two separate answers. Uh, you know, yeah. the latter one, post-COVID, of course. Uh, Pre-COVID, the discussion was a discretionary one between you and your manager. And uh, what we went by, what we didn't have a direct uh, data set to reference for that. We went by occupancy of buildings. So our highest occupancy would range in the mid 60% to 70%. And we were, we were cross-checking that against our parking rates, which wasn't the only way to do it, right? We, we didn't have a lot of other data sources. So at no point were we more than 60 to 70% occupied. And we use that to assume that our people were either traveling for work or working from home or you know, taking a vacation. And as we started reaching out to people more through the commute program and the other change management we were doing, we realized not a huge number, but say about 30, 40% of our people had a relatively high amount of flexibility in their work schedules. Uh, com the commute plan actually helped us push the question further of how do we grow that in the future. And of course, this COVID experience has shown us that we all need to do that. And that is the way forward. Excellent. Okay, thank you. Um, this next one, um, probably for you, Melanie, um, but Josh certainly can jump in. Um, I'm interested in learning about the neighborhood initiative. How are you, have you faced any GDPR issues? and how open are employees with sharing where they live with others? Yeah, uh, so oh, you wanna take it, Josh? No, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, we work really closely with HR. Um, so really kept just an overview of the neighborhood of initiative. We created those 36 zones, created the specific commute information for them, and then we reached out to employees living in those groups um, to hold events so they could meet their neighbors, to create the Slack channels, um, but the way that we built those was working really closely with HR to get the, the employee data of home locations and employee. That is a thing that we had to go through a ton of security and, you know, all, all of the, the, the hoops to jump through to get that access. And then we don't share it out. So we do our mapping and analysis. We invite people more broadly saying, we know you live in this region, but we're not connecting someone who lives, you know, down the street to someone else. Like that is for them to, to communicate as they're in those Slack channels and those meetings. Um, employees are pretty open to sharing. The Loom platform has the ability for an employee to put in their home address and it does have the ability um, for employees to volunteer to carpool or vanpool together. And so we saw high usage of that. 
And then this neighborhood initiative was just taking it a step further and giving them the real time access to each other. Um, it happens less in the public Slack channels, obviously, um, but we know in the events, employees would just, you know, say, I live here, let's talk and, and really share that information. But as far as us presenting any of those, that, that privacy data, we don't, we don't share it outward. It's just a thing that we work together with the HR um, from Expedia Group on. And, and just to be clear, what, what Melanie means by that also is that it's split up. So she'll get a list of names for a neighborhood saying A, B, C, D live here in this general zip code, if you will, or neighborhood. And then she'll get a second set of data without the names of the employees giving her locations. And they don't talk to each other. They're separate, discrete groups, but they correlate by neighborhood. So if employees choose to share information beyond that, that's at their discretion. But uh, we, don't, we don't get a chance to correlate data uh, on our own. That's great. Thank you for that. Good question. Um, this next question as well, uh, we got a few questions on the ORCA passes here. Um, are the ORCA passes automated now? And if so how much do the ORCA passes cost? Can we clarify what automated means? Uh, I think mainly just to be able to like kind of like a tap and go or like to be able to add, I guess you, I don't know if adding money to it. I'm not sure what that person meant by it. So uh, you were handing them out in person. She just said, got it. Got it. So, um, <laughs> yes, we were handing them out in person. We, our team is highly involved with new employee onboarding. So on everyone's first day, we meet with them, we present about the commute options, and then we host like a little drop in after they get out of their last meeting. And during that drop in, we basically asked, do you want an ORCA pass and explain the benefits of transit ridership and all the systems that are covered. Um, so yeah, we hand them out in real time. And then as you're handing it out, one of our team members is recording um, the card number in that person's Loom employee profile. So it's, it's automatically connected to them and we understand that they have it. Um, and that is the same to go for if you lose your pass or if you're an existing employee who decides they want to switch to transit, it's all requested through Loom. We pass them out, they can pick it up at walk-up desk or you know we make an appointment to go see them. Um, so very automated, very clean, lots of visibility into where those passes are, when someone loses them, when we need to turn them off, et cetera. Um, the ORCA recently switched to a different passport invoicing program for businesses. Um, Expedia subsidizes full transit, but it's based on actual employee usage. So I can't give a good estimate on how much it costs. It's different per person, given the system they're riding, how frequently they're riding, times of day that they're riding. Um, so it, there's like a lot of math that goes into that. And we really rely on KCM to support us there. Excellent. Okay, thank you. Um, I guess we'll hand this next one to you, Melanie, as well, since you're the ORCA uh, professional here. Uh, since providing ORCA passes for all, how has the use been? And we, uh, and this person said, we find it can be hard to sell sometimes for our work sites. Um, as I mentioned, we have great transit usage. Uh, we've got a 26% pre-pandemic transit mode share and a 10% van pool mode share. So, you know, wildly popular, I would say the the way that we saw that success was with our really detailed one-on-one -on -one outreach and working with employees to understand how they ride a bus, how which routes are available to them, how, the frequency of those routes, all of the things that you know people are nervous about as they switch to a new commute mode is really what has made the success of our transit program. Um, and we live in a place that has a great regional network. So it's not just buses, it's light rail, it's commuter rail. Um, there's a lot, a lot going into that, but it's it's helping the employee understand their options within those services. Yeah, certainly is a great area for transit. Um, this next question, uh, curious to know as well, did you at all incentivize employees to move closer to the office at all? Um, it was on the table as an option. I think benefits came up and said, uh, if you want to consider it, a couple of our financial partners could help you get mortgages and stuff, but there was no incentive beyond that. So they, they created some convenience relationships, but that was about it. Um, it wasn't so much the move. It was that we started attracting, because we announced it this far ahead, uh, prior to our move, we found that a lot of people who were joining Expedia were joining knowing that we were going to be in Seattle soon. So we actually started attracting a lot more 
Seattle based mm-hmm. would be employees, which so it was a very natural reset uh, in that sense. Uh, the Puget Sound region is highly competitive uh, living uh, conditions, you know, like it's not a cheap thing to do and it's not easy. So we weren't expecting too much and it just shifted our demographic uh, as we moved to Seattle. Excellent. Okay, thank you. Um, this next question, uh, probably for you, Josh and Melanie too. How are you measuring employee satisfaction? Um, a lot of it is survey. Um, so we do not just the every two years CTR, we actually do an annual, but we also do employee surveys other times. And because of uh, elements like Slack, we get a lot of instant feedback. Um, our employees give either a testimonial or a concern. So we're, we're seeing live real time, a comment come through and other people support it or not. And, uh, but our, our survey is actually pretty well, especially the commute ones, are actually pretty well responded to. Uh, we get a lot of good feedback there. And then of course our open houses and stuff. Yeah, so we do a an employee survey every two years, as just mentioned, the same time of year um, that asks a lot of the same questions just so we're tracking information year over year and understanding how employees are feeling. Um, that does have a specific question about employee satisfaction related to their commute options, their actual commute, like what they're actually doing our team and a handful of other things. And then as Josh mentioned, we do get really robust real-time feedback. So we've created some systems for tracking that. Um, It's everything from like the topic of the feedback to how many people have brought it up, how many people have supported that that comment um, and then what has been done about it. So we have a really uh, deep understanding of what our employees are saying and what they want to see from us. Excellent, okay. Skip around here a little bit, get some other questions that have recently come up. Um, this next one, how do you see the TDM strategy responding to COVID-19 requirements and greater hybrid work from home options? I don't know if that might be you, Josh. Um, you know, I think the flexibility of work from home, and it doesn't mean that everyone is suddenly just gonna stay home and not show up, right? Uh, people are suddenly going to have new scenarios that they need to deal with. And I think they're going to need somebody to help them navigate those choices. And so I do see uh, the requirement being there and the the questions actually shifting. And so the scenario planning that needs to go on is going to be slightly different to what we had in say March. Okay, excellent kind of to this point a little bit, you know, is there pressure to reduce TDM now with more folks working remotely? Will a higher level of remote work be expected from this point forward? Um, I think it would, we, you know, all that, I don't think anything is off the table, right? No, nobody's really open to that scale yet to know that. Um, I think what it is going to do is it's going to shift the conversation some. So, we had hoped right up to February, we were so thrilled with our SOV rate dropping the way it did uh, that we didn't anticipate that we're suddenly going to be in this place where people are going to need to come in um, and want to drive single occupant vehicles, right? Um, so there is a shift, but we also have, uh, on our part specifically, we have a requirement from the city that we report out very robustly. And so I don't see our program shifting dramatically from a personnel point of view. I do see our programs adjusting post COVID with all these new considerations. Okay, excellent. Uh, This next question, um, probably for you, Josh, was there cost savings from the move that funded the enhanced TDM efforts? Um, It was a split. So some of it was, um, you know, what the city of Seattle required us to do. So that was going in, just going in, that was a a commitment, a capital commitment, e.g. agreed to. Um, But yes, on the flip side, the conversation we had with Nelson Nygaard when they joined was, we are spending so much on, and this was in Bellevue, we are spending X on subsidized parking, day over day, month over month in Bellevue. 
And um, how do we how do we balance out that cost to Expedia with the cost of these programs, and then carry that same construct through to Seattle? So a huge part of it was if we can save Expedia money on parking that Expedia was paying for. And so the capital investment on Expedia side stays frozen rather than growing with every parking spot we added on. How could we then reallocate some of those funds to some of these other programs? And so, yes, there, there was a very interesting conversation on how, our, uh, how at some point it could become a self-funded program. And that really worked well for Seattle where we were charging we were required by the city to charge for parking and then parking would pay for um, a lot of the other programs that we were planning. Okay. I know you've mentioned, uh, and we, at the beginning of this uh, webinar, and we talked about, you know, folks will probably be returning more of a hybrid approach here. Um, this next question asks, you know, when people do go back to work, Josh, what is Expedia expecting in regard to percentage of employees returning to work and or utilizing Expedia sponsored transit options in the future? Um, you know, your guest right now is going to be as good as mine. <laughs> Uh, employee sentiment has been shifting. So I think if we talked about this in April, uh, I think generally everybody felt, oh, I'm never going back. And over the last few months, it's sort of become like, I want to come back, but, and a lot of the but is around, you know, their personal home life, et cetera. So I do think, I do think it's going to end up being a very robust employee choice for individuals at a very personal level as to what they'd like to do. And I think Expedia would support that. The question becomes when they want to come in, how can we support them? And so that's, that's how we're playing it. We don't have any clue yet as to how much they wanna come in. You know, numbers are rising uh, in Washington state right now. And um, so we're gonna, we're gonna go in very low to start whenever we do. And we're going to be flexible enough to adapt when we keep getting data on people returning and, uh, and study that very hard to plan for the, the future. Excellent, okay. Um, this next question I thought it was kind of interesting, uh, just came up. How did the move affect employee retention? Did you find it to gain more employees? Did you lose some? What was the retention like after you moved? You know, it actually balanced out really well. Um, again, we announced our move four years before we actually moved. So people who started out in uh, 2016 saying, oh my God, I will never move to Seattle. They had ample <clears throat> time to either change their minds or find another role somewhere else. And uh, the closer we got to our move in 2019, we found more and more people joining uh, that said, oh, I'm moving here from the Bay Area 13 miles is nothing, or I'd love to live in the city, or I just got a place in low Queen Anne and can't wait for the move to happen. So um, because it was such a long drawn out piece, we didn't find a massive hit to our retention plan mm -hmm. at all. Um, it happened incrementally over time. We did find that moving to Seattle actually became highly attractive to uh, individuals who already lived in the uh, Seattle side of the pond. Okay. Uh, just going to real quickly ask this question because we got a few of them from both the chat and the Q&A. Um, folks are trying to kind of figure out, you know, looking at their own parking demand issues. How many employees are located in the Seattle region? In, uh, so sorry, do you mean in the Seattle region as overall, what is our employee base right now? Yeah, I would guess that's what they're looking at, yeah. Uh, we're about, I think we've been everything right up to about 4,500. And with everything going on right now, we may be at about 4,000. Wow, okay. Um, this person said, you know, thank you for a great webinar. From the Expedia perspective, could you talk about the working relationship with Seattle DOT? What was helpful or not helpful from SDOT and when it came to changing your TDM program and how, was, how has this working relationship continued? 
um, it's a very progressive group, um, S dot, and and so they really put us. Uh, we had to game up for that candidly. Um, you know, we could not come in as a suburban. Let's just go and get another parking spot for this new employee sort of approach, um, and that's why uh, it was really key for us that you know, we strategize with Nelson Nygaard. Um, the, the relationship has continued to be good. They really met us halfway. They asked us to innovate on the shuttle management, uh, the shuttle program. That was their first time, right, Melanie, that they'd asked for an employer to start a shuttle program, if I'm not mistaken. To provide like the, the background and reasoning and understanding of a shuttle program. So we yeah. had a full shuttle implementation plan in addition to our TMP and master use permit for that site. So it was, we were really connected with SDOT and still, still are. And it's worked out well. I think we, we are transparent and they appreciate that and they have shown a willingness to work with us. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, haven't really heard you fully mention it yet, but what are the plans to return to office in order to keep the telework going forward? Um, we're looking like every every other employer in the region. We're just looking at the right time to commit to that. Uh, we are looking to um, January, but again, let's see. Let's see what happens. <laughs> um, so I think it's a moving target, uh, but we would like people to come back. We think we've created safe enough conditions. It's just going to depend now on getting enough of a group of employees to feel that way to restart that process. Okay, let's see if we can get one or two more questions in here before we finish up. Um, this next one for both you or uh, Melanie. Um, has there been a discussion on how the transit pass program might be changed due to the pandemic? Example, given that employees using transit might come in less often to work now and post COVID. So would it still be economical to issue monthly passes or would there be other forms of incentives for less frequent transit commuters? So um, as I mentioned, the ORCA pass program that we use is not based on a monthly pass program. It's actually based on someone's transit usage. Um, so we are invoiced or responsible for someone's actual trips. So if we think that people aren't coming to campus every day um, or you know, maybe trying to choose other modes, we anticipate that our, our transit costs will go down in the short term. And then you know, as life starts to return to normal and transit comes back online with budgeting improvements and you know, the pandemic goes away, we'll you know, return to our previous levels, hopefully. Um, so not anticipating a long-term change in any sort of cost or participation there, but the ebb and flow with the pandemic. So that is different for transportation systems around the country and the way that they structure their employer passes. Some are monthly passes, and I think those would need to be, you know, really looked at it in a cost benefit analysis. But for us, because it is the actual trips, it's a little bit more flexible and we have a little bit more ability to, to forecast those costs. Okay, great. Uh, see if I can get another question in here real quickly. Um, how did you all in implement daily incentives for those who use alternate modes? With Loom. <laughs> um, can you give some a little more of an example? Yeah. So the, the, um, one of the reasons that we chose to partner with a system like Gloom in 2017 is because of the technology functions. Um, it's all tied to badge swipes and trip logging and payroll. And it makes it really easy for us team to have that all be very automated. Um, someone bikes in, they park their bike, they log their trip and their commute calendar on either the Loom app or their desktop. That is automatically connected to the payroll system. It's all just very fluid. And our team is reviewing that data on what people say they're doing versus you know, any other badge scans they may have or if they're actually on campus and just kind of seeing what employees are actually doing versus what they say they're doing to keep, keep costs you know, and people honest. But it's, it's really simple and really, really useful. And it's easy for employees, which I would say is the nicest part. Like it is not a heavy lift. It is not confusing. They just have a really, really simple singular action every day. That's a great place to end it all here. And uh, I want to thank all of our panelists today uh, for a wonderful job. We did not get through all of our questions, believe it or not, even with 20 minutes left. Um, so I encourage any of you, if we did not answer your question today, to please reach out to
to our panelists below. Uh, we want to thank you all again for a wonderful webinar. Thank Loom, our sponsor today, for uh, for hosting this. And I uh, want to let you all know that our next webinar will be uh, Thursday, November 17th. It will be on implementing safety features to build writer trust. And that will be sponsored by TripShot, excuse me, Tuesday, November 17th. And registration for that will be open tomorrow. So once again, I want to thank all of you for joining us today. We had a great turnout and we appreciate it. And I hope you all have a great rest of your afternoon. Bye-bye.